Good morning. Mark Garner is my name, and uh, I've had the incredible privilege of going into space. I went into space on three occasions on the uh, U.S. Space Shuttle, the first time on Challenger and twice on Endeavour, and uh, it changed my life. It changed the way I look at planet Earth. I was the 150th person, human being, to go into space. So far, there have been about 600 people that have been in space. I've been around planet Earth during my three missions about 450 times. So I've had a good look at it. And really what has happened is that I look at planet Earth differently today. To get into space, it's only an eight and a half minute ride. You get on that shuttle, when it uh, takes off eight and a half minutes later, you are going at 28,000 kilometers an hour, and you're about three or 400 kilometers above the Earth. So it's a quick ride. That's eight kilometers per second. For those who uh, want to do the math, it means you go around the planet in 90 minutes and uh, 16 times every day. You get to see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets. And you're up there to do some work. But when you have some spare time, you're looking out the window. That's kind of what it looks like to look out the window on the space shuttle. We're over the Middle East there. And what I really want to draw your attention to is the fact that we have an atmosphere. Look on the horizon and see how thin it is. That is the horizon that allows us to live on this planet. That atmosphere, that very thin layer, which is like the outer layer on a skin on, on an onion, and that's how thin it is, and that's how fragile it is, and yet it has the oxygen that allows us to live down here on this planet. So that's the kind of perspective that you get when you go up there. There are lots of spacecraft up there and satellites, but they're higher up, some of them quite a bit high up. And it is looking out the window at that perspective that really changed the way that I view uh, life down here on planet Earth. There are seven billion of us at the moment in about 200 countries. And by the middle of the century, there may be as many as nine billion. We are putting a strain on our planet. It's not because we're being totally careless. Some of it is well-intentioned, but we are putting a strain on our planet. Climate change is occurring. Global warming is occurring. We are putting a lot of pollutants into the air. We're doing a lot of other things to our planet. This is a shot from space over Lake Erie. What's disturbing there is that sort of yellowish color. And that yellowish cover, color is pollution. It's sulfur dioxide. It's nitrous oxide. It's pollutants, mainly from coal in this case, airborne coal. And that's over uh, Toronto, right here. You've all witnessed smog days in the summertime here in, in the Toronto area. And that is part of the price that we're paying for all of the energy and all of the hydrocarbons that we consume down here on planet Earth. And I've seen similar clouds like that over all of California, over all of the Mediterranean, over all of China, all over all of India. For deforestation. When I first flew in 1984, we went over the rainforest many, many times, and I couldn't see it. Why? Because there were fires everywhere, deliberately set. They were clearing land by burning the, the rainforest so that they would have agricultural land for the inhabitants of Brazil. The intention was good, but if you look at that picture there, 40 years ago, that would have been all green. That's an area of, uh, of Brazil where a lot of fires have been set deliberately to clear. So deforestation is another one of the things that we are doing to our planet. This is a shot of a river in Madagascar. And what you see going into the Indian Ocean, looks a little bit like blood, uh, is the rich topsoil that has been washed away. Why? Because of deforestation, then leading to soil erosion, and then eventually desertification with all of that soil washing into the ocean. It's not because the people of Madagascar uh, were careless in cutting down the forests. It's because they needed the wood. But there are consequences to these things. And these are not the only, this is not the only example. One of the things that I've seen in the three flights that I have flown on over a 16-year period is actual changes in our glaciers. They're retreating. They're like the canary in the coal, coal mine. They really 
show very dramatically that global warming is occurring because they're moving back, even in the span of our lifetimes. And this is a particular glacier that's in uh, Argentina. Space offers us an incredible opportunity to look back at planet Earth. And that's the idea, as Corey said, ideas. That's the idea I want to leave with you. This is an important time in the history of planet Earth, and we need to use space to look back at planet Earth that we all share, all seven billion of us, because the planet is changing, and we need to follow that very, very carefully. Hopefully, we will make a change to the kind of planet that we want to be on, but right now, we've got some serious damage control to do. Canada has been a pioneer in space. We were the third country in space. The theme here today is revolution. Well, it was a revolution when Sputnik was launched in 1957 and ushered in the space era. 55 years later, we've come a long way. And one of the reasons we go into space is not just to look out into the universe and ask ourselves the questions about, you know, how was the universe created? One of the most useful things is to go into space to look back at planet Earth. Canada has been a pioneer in that area. We went into space initially, you're seeing here communication satellites, because we're the second largest country on Earth, and we wanted to be able to communicate with each other, and we couldn't communicate with people in the far north or in remote areas unless we built communication satellites. That's an example of it. Another area is looking back at the second largest country on Earth, Canada, a country which has a huge boreal forest, a country that has, which is blessed with large agricultural lands, which has many rivers and lakes, is surrounded by three oceans, which has the Arctic, of course, which, where we know that the, the ice cover is diminishing, and it's changing things dramatically. So looking back down to Earth, from our perspective here in Canada, makes a great deal of sense. The North is melting. You all know that. And we need to First of all, monitor it, and hopefully, secondly, reverse that trend. And it's going to take a long time. But space offers us the opportunity, because it's a big and empty place, to measure accurately the rate of progress of that melting. And so there is one of the advantages of looking back down. One of the areas where Canada is particularly strong is what we call uh, radar-based uh, observation, Earth observation. Canada is covered with cloud quite often and is in darkness. And the trouble with looking down at Earth with a camera, an ordinary camera, is that in darkness or when there's cloud cover, you can't see what's below. So we in Canada became pioneers in what is called synthetic aperture radar technology. And RadarSat 2, which you see there, is an example of that. This is a sensor that can see through the clouds and can see at nighttime and can give us an accurate picture of what is happening down on the surface of the Earth and in the surrounding oceans around it. Another area where Canada is a pioneer and it's very important is putting scientific instruments on satellites. This one happens to be a Canadian experiment on a U.S. satellite that looks at pollution in the troposphere. And this has been a very successful experiment. The troposphere, as you know, is the first layer from the Earth upwards, the one that has the clouds and where a lot of the pollution is located. These are just examples of sensors. They could be in the infrared. They could be in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They could be in the radio wave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's a richness of information that's available from these different sensors up in space looking down at planet Earth and we need to have more of them, and we need to monitor our planet continuously because there are places with climate change that are going to turn into deserts. Other places are going to become wetter. Uh, pollution is going to continue to uh, take its toll on our environment. The ozone layer, which in this case you're looking at the upper atmosphere, is also important to us, and you've all heard of the ozone hole. All of these things can be monitored from space by different kinds of sensors. Here's an American satellite called CloudSat. And it looks at, yes, it looks at clouds. It may sound a little bit boring, but clouds are very, very important in understanding global weather patterns. Another example uh, is what we call a hyperspectral. 
This is a little bit in the realm of somewhat of science fiction. We're not there. But if you take a very narrow band of wavelengths and look at them, down at what is coming off the Earth in terms of that kind of radiation, you can learn some very, very important things about what is happening down on Earth. We all are aware of the fact that from space we can also see natural disasters evolving. We can see oil spills. We can see where the ice is and how the ice is flowing and what effect it has on navigation. We can see the state of our boreal forest of the rainforest and other forests that are great huge lungs and important in terms of managing the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. We can look at our agricultural lands. The amount of moisture in the soil can be measured from space and that's going to tell you about crop yields. So there's a host of things that you can do from space with sensors if you build them and put them up there. And hyperspectral satellites have the potential of allowing us to look at all sorts of specific things that we've never looked at before. I want to finish by saying that uh, we have some challenges ahead and we, if we all are very conscious of the fact that the Earth is a system that we all share together, we certainly share its atmosphere, we certainly share its oceans, then I think that collectively, uh, if we monitor our planet, then the first thing that we'll, we'll benefit from is knowing exactly what is happening because we still have a long ways to go in fully understanding it. And the second thing that we'll, uh, that will lead to is us acting, uh, I think, in a, more, in a more forceful way to try to reverse the trend. And certainly here in Canada, we have a long way to go in terms of taking our responsibilities uh, with respect to the environment. You, you do know that Canada is the second largest per capita producer of greenhouse gases. So we definitely need to be in this game and taking our responsibilities. We live on a beautiful planet, planet Earth. We have not yet developed the technology to go at warp speed. We're not going to be leaving our planet for quite some time to come. We're not ready to leave our planet and we can't leave our planet the population of the planet is growing. The good news is that we're all learning more about what is happening on planet Earth. Space is one way for us to measure very, very accurately what is happening down on the sur uh, surface of our planet and on our oceans. So that's the idea I want to leave with you, and perhaps some of you might one day be involved in designing the kinds of sensors that we can use to look back at our beautiful planet, the home of all of humanity, the home that we all share together. Thank you very much. Thank you.